everyone deserves a shot at the American dream, and we've got to figure out ways uh, to close that gap. Uh, we aren't anti-wealth. I mean, everybody likes to have money in their pockets, uh, but you've got to be fair about it, and you've got to give people an opportunity uh, to achieve their goals of moving into the middle class and uh, achieving the American dream. And uh, that American dream is awfully hard to achieve for many, many families right now. One thing that some of the corporate elite, I think, fail to realize is that <clears throat> the business model they use now, which is make it in the cheapest corner of the third world, ship it to America, drop the profits off in a tax haven, and sell it in America, is beginning to suffer some huge strains because the people in America, their customer base, they're running out of money, and they're running out of credit. So the system, I think, is in huge danger, and I'm hoping that the elites realize that and begin to uh, bring some manufacturing back into America, uh, allow some unions to thrive so that uh, we can get our customers to have more money. There were 60 people in the room, women and children as well as men, in Oklahoma City, trying to start an oil workers union. Six men came in with overcoats on and they didn't take their overcoats off. They just stood against the back wall. And the organizer leaned over to me and Woody Guthrie, the other, other singer there. Woody was the extraordinary man who wrote This Land Is Your Land and several thousand other songs. Uh, he says, those men don't take off their overcoats. They may have clubs under them. They may be intending to break up the meeting. See if you can get the crowd singing. Well, we did get them all singing, the, the women and kids too. And they never did break up the meeting. Afterwards, they came forward and said, you know, this is a, diff a different kind of a meeting than we were told it was going to be. We were told you were a bunch of communists who wanted to overthrow the government. What other country on the planet gives corporations the tax break if they move jobs out of the country? Tell me it. Does, does Germany give you a tax break if you leave Germany? Does France? Does China? Does Japan? Does Brazil? Which country gives you a tax break if you leave the country? Only one. United States of America. Yeah. And we were determined not to let one bullet kill a movement. Only a man, but not a movement. We thought Dr. King would have us pick up the broken pieces. Uh, and move on. Uh, and Dr. Lauer would often say it's not so much who killed him, but what killed him, a sick society. So we felt the burden, even with heavy hearts and lots of pain, to march on. Uh, because if we, had, if, we had, uh, if we had stopped at Calvary, so to speak, we couldn't have gone on to the resurrection. So we went on, we marched, and marched we marched in, uh, uh, in Memphis. Uh, we. Um, on to Washington for the, to the Resurrection City, the Bull People's Campaign. We refuse to let one bullet kill a movement. You know, if Mother Jones could face down bayonets, maybe we, we can do that. And she did. I mean, uh, just one story, I, I love to relate this uh, uh, story of a man who went to one of her speeches. He had traveled 100 miles in the end uh, by train, and, and they asked him, why are you here? And he said, well, my son was in a battle in um, Colorado, and the soldier took out a bayonet and was going to stab him with the bayonet, and Mother Jones stepped right in front of it. And so I wanted to thank her for her bravery. He added, my son was killed later on, but at least at that point, you know, that she saved him. And I thought, what, a, what a, a powerful story about the labor movement, about how people faced this kind of terror. That right to collective bargaining, that right to uh, try to uh, improve your pay and working conditions is uh, not only important to the union members, but very important to the general public. In fact, it was, I believe, the foundation of the middle class uh, of this country. Right now, um, right now, we don't have that. And uh, what we're watching is a collapse of the middle class. And I think uh, it's important that individuals understand that they don't need to stay, stand alone, that they can stand together with others 
and work to improve their lot in life, and that's what they need to do. There is a rice company in Greenville, Mississippi, known, used to be known as Uncle Ben's, but now it's the Mars Food Company, and they make candy bars too, not just rice. But they have a temporary worker system where you can work there for 10 years and still be called a temporary worker. And when asked how, how can you justify keeping someone on as a temporary worker and never making them permanent for 10 years, one of their managers said to me one time, well, that's a job we don't need anyone permanent for. But who, who do you think you're talking to and who do you think believes you when you say that? If I work for 10 years, I'm permanent. I'm full time and I'm permanent. The difference is I'm not regarded as a real employee. Thus, you don't have to pay me benefits and you don't have to negotiate with me for a decent wage. George Bear made a statement that the men of labor should basically get down on their knees and thank God for men like us that were here to give you work. This is almost like the divine right of kings that they fought, they'd fought over here before the Magna Carta and what have you over in England. So you had a, a mindset that we're, we're the ones that, that put this business together and, and uh, they deserve to make a profit. But to what extent you deserve to make a profit, the point here where you have to uh, you, you subjugate people here to the point where they're, they're, they're slaves. And basically that's what they were. They were kind of an economic uh, merry-go-round that they couldn't get out of. No, no schools. Don't, don't build a school in the area because you, if you educated your workforce, you'd lose your laboring, laboring class. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is where our movement, by the way, needs to do a little bit better, too, on our own end. Uh, the, the, the way in which that we have sort of allowed the uh, conservative forces, corporate forces, to demonize school teachers, uh, people who uh, uh, work to stop violence in the home of children, who work, you know, who are paid by the government, um, uh, it is a very conscientious attack by corporate America. And it has one primary motivation, and it's that that's the highest unionized sector of the country right now. So they're busy focusing on how to destroy good jobs in the so-called private sector. And they kind of succeed, right? We're at single digits, uh, unionization rates in the private sector in America. And then they begin the pivot, which is now they've got to come out against the last highly unionized sector of workers in this country, the last people who are, by the way, mostly women and mostly people of color. The, the biggest source of good jobs in this country for people of color is in the public sector. Especially in the 19th century, the, the, the Pinkertons were, you know, they had the largest, the larger standing army than the U.S. government at that point. It's, it's a private army that is out there for hire, able to come in and, and assert themselves. So there was already this pattern out there prior to 1892 of the Pinkertons coming in with Henry Clay Frick and others into the coal fields and the coke fields into other mills um, of pretty much you know kind of splitting heads and and being very violent rather than coming in to keep the peace. We had a peculiar institution here that nobody else had called the Coal and Iron Police which were quasi state police but hired by private companies completely and paid for and housed by private companies but had state power. Nobody else had this and they were, uh, they were much more dangerous and worse for Pennsylvania than the Pinkertons. They controlled the coal fields they, in the Mon Valley. They were the ones who were largely the backbone of this 25,000 armed men that U.S. still controlled uh, with the coal and irons. And they weren't uh, overthrown till the 30s. You look anywhere around the world, and for in a key component to setting up a democratic society is having a strong independent labor movement. And it's kind of ironic that for years, it doesn't matter whether it was a Republican president or a Democratic president, they understood if they wanted to help build democracy, whether it was in South Africa or South America or Eastern Europe, wherever, one of the ways to do that was to support a strong trade union movement. And in every advanced democratic society, there is a strong trade union movement. And then in countries like Hitler's fascism or Russia, when they didn't want democracy, what, who, did, who were one of the first groups they went after? It was the trade unions. So if you want a democratic society, if you want a society with a strong middle class, if you want a society that values metrics like having the best education system for kids, f properly funding education, having free education, at trade school or college or university level, the stronger the labor movement is, the more likely you're to have 
not just the more likely, factually, the, the better metrics you'll have and all those factors that I think are important to having a good middle class democratic society.